Thanks. OK, so let's start by, uh, with the uh, strange name. Uh, my name is Shachar Leon Brenner. So that's three names you can choose from. I, I say that every lecture. Uh, Shachar is a Hebrew name. It's kind of hard to pronounce, uh, but it means the sunrise. So it's a, it's a very poetic name. So you can try and use it if you want. Um, as was just said, uh, my expertise is psychoanalysis and especially uh, Lacan. But today we're not going to do that so much. Uh, we're going to do that in the next meeting when we're going to talk about the unconscious. And if you're interested in that, really recommend on coming because I really like that lecture. Uh, today we're going to do something else. Um, we're going to be quite analytical today. Uh, that means, um, you know, in philosophy there's a divide between um, continental philosophy from the continent, the only continent in the world, Europe, right? So that's continental philosophy. And then you have analytical philosophy, which is traditionally from the United States. And you can differentiate them by their haircut. Uh, so uh, continental philosophers have like very wild, crazy haircuts. Uh, the analytical are very sharp. You know, they have these like sharp haircuts. Also with the preference of wine uh, when doing uh, psychology uh, and philosophy, that's definitely a continental uh, perspective on things. So today we're going to be the analytical, although at heart I do prefer uh, drinking some wine before a lecture. Okay? Uh, so bear with me and I'm going to give you sort of like uh, my interpretation of, of this whole uh, perspective. Today we're going to ask uh, one question, what is consciousness? It's a very big question. I usually ask in the beginning, what is consciousness? But I think you guys seem a little shy. So we're going to do a, an experiment uh, before uh, we start and ask ourselves, what is this thing that we wake up every morning and sort of gain? You know, we we'll go to sleep and then we sort of like don't actually or absolutely have it. And then we wake up and everything is the same. I experience the world through this thing with, that we call a consciousness. So we're going to ask what it is and we're going to sort of try and pinpoint it. Where does it exist? So we start with an experiment and this is based on a lecture by Daniel Dennett, which is a very famous analytical philosopher uh, that deals with the question of consciousness. Dennett is sort of like the um, obnoxious uncle, constantly uh, screaming, there is no such thing as consciousness. We're going to see if we're going to agree with that. But this is from one of his lectures. This is an experiment. Uh, what I want you guys to do is to look at the white cross in the middle of the screen, sort of concentrate on the white cross for a couple of seconds. So if you can just do that for me for five seconds. Very good. And now, OK. Uh, what did you see? Did anybody see? Did it work? Should we do it again? So what did, what did you see after I switched the <laughs> slide? A, so you saw a cross, but right here, what, did you see anything else appear around here? What did you see? The flag, right. But it wasn't exactly this color, right? It was a different color. You want to try this again? Let's do this again. Concentrate on the flag. Don't move your eyes. You want to maybe turn off the lights? It's, it's just so fun, this experiment. Yeah. So just look at the cross. And now. Did you see it just for one second? A bigger cross. A bigger cross. Like we saw the flag, but it had different colors, right? It appeared as though we can turn the lights on. Uh, in the back, if you can turn the lights on. Um, it appeared as though it has the real colors of the British flag. Right? Uh, if not, you can try this at home, <laughs> don't worry. It's, it works, right? It's like that. Now, the question is, um, do you agree with this sentence? The people that at least saw the uh, British flag, uh, the big red cross was intersecting with the little black cross, this black cross. So for a second there, the big red cross was intersecting with the black cross. Uh, you guys saw it, right? Do you agree with that? Right. Right, that's what we saw. But the question that I want to ask you is, where was the red cross? So there was no red cross on the screen. The screen did not present a red cross, right? We presented 
an inverted color, a blue cross. So the screen did not present a red cross, but yet you did see a red cross. Okay. So it's not the screen. Um, is, is it your eyes? Maybe your retina. Maybe some light bounced from the red cross into your retina. But this is not the case as well. Your retina did not receive any photons, any light waves that sort of transmit red. Right? So, okay, maybe it's not your retina, maybe it's your brain. Maybe there was red in your brain, but this is sort of like a little picture of the uh, visual cortex. And I can promise you there is no red cross in your brain. Your brain has these very intricate network of wires and which transmits electrical signals. It does not transmit red. There is no red in your brain. So if the red is not on the screen, not on the retina, and not on the brain, where is it? Right? It's a valid question. Right? Any ideas? Where does it exist? This is the point where you actually say things. Okay. <laughs> so, so any ideas? Somebody can help me out? Sorry? So, but when we're talking about perception, your senses did not perceive red. Nowhere in your perceptual system does the color red exist because there was no red for you to perceive. So it's not in your perceptual system. Where is it? So one guy, and we talked about him in the first lecture where we met, uh, this uh, guy called René Descartes, uh, which we had a lovely uh, discussion about, uh, he had some answers to this question, um, and he said that in order to understand where this red exists, we need to differentiate between two levels of existence, let's say. We're, we're simplifying this a bit. One of matter and one of the mind. Descartes was the first thinker, the father of modern philosophy, because he situated us uh, in the domain of the subject. He started with this thing that he invented, the thinking being, that was uh, what we talked about in the past, and he said, we need to start from there. So this is a little schema that Lacan provides. Um, I sort of changed it a bit to be more relevant to our case. So how does Descartes uh, explain the phenomenon of the red flag? He says uh, there is a yellow-blue flag somewhere here on the screen, and light bounces off the flag into your eyes. You can definitely say this, okay? Uh, so light bounces from the flag into your eyes. Uh, your eyes connected to the nervous system. Again, we have to forgive, forgive Descartes a bit about his medical explanations, but it, the eyes are connected to the nervous system and makes the nervous system sort of vibrate, let's call it. Okay? These vibrations cause a specific part of the brain, what is called the pineal gland, which was very important for Descartes. Descartes said the pineal gland is the seat of the soul. He sort of said that the soul connects to the body through the pineal gland. So the nervous system vibrates. It causes the pineal gland to send an immaterial signal to the soul in a different way, place, a different dimension. Then the soul perceives what is the blue flag and red flag and send another immaterial signal to the pineal gland back. And then the pineal gland causes the brain to move the nervous system, and you guys point at the screen and say, oh, whoa, that's a red cross. Right? That's how Descartes <laughs> explains this phenomenon. This is called Cartesian dualism. It's dualism because there's, there are two things in the universe sort of interacting, and they're completely different. See, there's like a complete divide here. So we said, we said the red cross is not on the screen, and it's not in your eye, and it's not in your brain. And Descartes will say, of course, it's in your soul. It's in this thing, this immaterial thing. And only there did the perception of the red flag appear. I don't know, you might be skeptical. It's OK. Cartesian dualism is not the most uh, appreciated uh, perspective today. 
Uh, there are many more, uh, just for summary, because this is not uh, our subject today, but just to indulge you guys, this is the uh, Cartesian dualism, and here you see the uh, pineal gland. This is sort of like a uh, pine cone, because it looks a bit like a pine cone. And we see the mind and the physical part, the uh, mat matter sort of corresponding through this thing, through this organ, this magical organ. Uh, on the other side, we have monism. Monism is different than dualism because dualism says there are two substances in the world. And monism says there's only one substance in the world. And there are several types of, mon of monisms. Again, we're not going to go delve into this today, but uh, you probably know materialism. Materialism says the only substance is material. There is nothing else other than material, than your brain, than your physical body. There's no soul. On the other hand, we have idealism that says exactly the opposite. There is no body. Everything is in the dimension of the soul. Everything we see, the conception of a body, is a manifestation of the dimension of the soul. And we also have um, neutral monism, which is related to Spinoza. I just really like this philosopher, so uh, kind of mentioned it. He says uh, there's no difference between, uh, between the mind and material. There is a bigger substance, which include bo includes both of them. So these are kind of ways to answer the question that I asked you. Where is the Red Cross? These guys would say the Red Cross is somewhere in the material, in our body. This guy would say, oh, it only exists in the soul. And here we have a completely different uh, answer uh, for that. Um, up until now, are we OK? Good, OK. A couple of people uh, nodding their heads makes me happy, just so you know. Uh, okay, now, this whole thing about the Red Cross obviously was uh, regarding consciousness. That's our main question today. What is consciousness? Because this uh, image of the red flag in your mind was you being conscious to something. It's an experience. It's a conscious experience. And the question of consciousness has not been only answered in the domain of philosophy, like we try, I try to present Right now, it, had many, it has many answers and many studies trying to understand what consciousness uh, is. So, uh, for instance, on the side of medicine, uh, we have people uh, really measuring the electrical activity uh, in the brain or what uh, in hospitals is called awakeness. You know, you, you actually get a paper and you mark like a cross, this is, yeah, 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 yeah. And if it's like five out of 10 or something like that, the person has consciousness. So that's like a whole field in medicine trying to understand how consciousness works. Uh, on the other side, we have psychology, uh, specifically cognitive psychology, doing a lot of interesting work on consciousness, uh, concentrating on perception, like what we just did, the experiment, that's sort of an experiment about consciousness of perception. Uh, talking about causal systems, um, intentionality, that's another aspect we won't touch today. So that's the field of psychology. And in philosophy, we also deal with this question in kind of different ways, and you see different concepts coming here. This is uh, cogito ego sum, this is the uh, Cartesian uh, va validity point of uh, validity in the world. This is the thinking being, this is where Descartes talks about consciousness. Also the self, we're gonna talk about the self, selfhood, experience of self, uh, introspection, right? What is introspection? Looking inside, it's sort of introspection is a very conscious process, right? It's something that requires you to be conscious in order to do it. Um, in philosophy, the question of consciousness is divided into two major problems. Uh, this guy, David Chalmers, uh, a <laughs> philosopher I really like. Uh, first of all, because he's Australian. Well, obviously, he needs to be liked. But second, because he is a, a lead singer in a metal band. So, you know, philosopher and rock and roll, that's really great. And you can see from his picture that he, <laughs> that he definitely wears this. Uh, this sort of quite characteristic. And David Chalmers says there are two problems, uh, major problems about consciousness. There's the easy problem, 
uh, which asks like, how does our brain work? How does consciousness work in our brain? Uh, how do I see? How do I hear? How do I walk? Uh, the goal of the people investigating the easy problem is to pinpoint which mechanism is in the brain uh, is in charge of consciousness and sort of explain how it works. That's sort of a different lecture. Today, um, the hard problem is different. Uh, Charles, Charles says the hard problem is, will answer questions like, why do we have a subjective experience? You know, we could have very much had a great life or, I don't know, procreated as a species uh, without being subjectively aware to our experiences. But still we have that, so why? Uh, why do our perceptions have personal quality? Like, why does my experience of, I don't know, a red BMX bike is very different than other people? Because I had a red BMX bike when I was a child. But when I see it, it sort of brings out a different a different feeling, a different perspective on the same, on the same input, right? Um, what is the relation between physical phenomenon and experience? That's exactly what uh, we're trying to do with the body and mind question. So these are the hard questions that are needed to answer in order to understand consciousness. And when we are gonna do, we're gonna try and answer this hard question today. And when we're gonna do this, we just need to make a clear, like a, a clear distinction between two major parts of the research of consciousness. Uh, the one part is the mind. How does the mind work? How, when we look at the mind as a system of conscious functions working in the brain, how does it work? You see this, uh, this says here is the area where you recognize spaces, this is the FFA, this is the area where you recognize faces, etc., etc. And we're not really going to ask that question. We're more going to concentrate today on the question of self. What is consciousness of self? What is the subjective experience that every one of you has in the world? This is consciousness. Okay? Okay, so that was sort of an introduction. Um, you with me? Good, more heads. Nodding, happier, okay. So can we explain consciousness? That's basic question before we try and do it, right? So some people say, no way, no way. We can't, we can't really uh, do that. Uh, and they have some very compelling ideas to convince us. Mm. I'll start by introducing you to um, this concept called qualia. It's a philosophical qu concept. And I would say, very simply, that qualia is the subjective experience, your, your own personal experience of, let's say, a perception. So qualia would be the experience of redness. I'm looking at a red color and I experience redness. It's sort of something that I experience in myself. Right? Now, in order to understand this, and this is interesting because this is another field of philosophy that grew in Australia, which is interesting, the, the philosophy of zombies. I'm not shitting you, it's real. There's a philosophy of zombies, yes. And I, as a person that's sort of very critical of science fiction movies, um, I, I was really happy to see that people are working on that thing, okay? Uh, because, you know, zombies are very uh, different in, in zombie movies. You have the zombies that, uh, you know, they eat the brain, some of them don't eat the brain, uh, some of them are really slow, which I prefer always, and there's the really scary ones that run really fast, which is really, really, really scary and terrifying. So there's a big confusion about what a zombie is. So some Australian people decided, uh, some Australian philosophers decided we should sort of take this seriously and define what a zombie is. And they came up with a concept. It's called the philosophical zombie. Okay? And the philosophical zombie is, is not, it's not like dead necessarily. It's not rotting necessarily. It doesn't want to eat brains or your body and stuff like that. It actually looks exactly like a regular person, like you. It actually behaves like a regular person. It's an actual guy, you know, there was a child, went to school, had friends, maybe came today to a lecture here. It still points places. 
looks and acts exactly like a normal, regular, non-zombie human being. What's the difference between a zombie and a regular human being? Zombie walks in the world like a human being, but lacks one thing, and that is the qualia. So zombies, when they walk in the world, have no experience of redness. They might see the red sign, and I might ask them, what color is the, uh, are the letters here? And they'll say that it's red. But they will not have the subjective experience of redness. Okay, so the question is, how do I know that you're not philosophical zombies? Right, do you know that you're not philosophical zombies? Of course you do. Why? Because? Do you experience, have you experienced redness in your life? I'm guessing, yeah, I'm guessing. Like, you know, there's all, I always give the example of brushing your teeth, because it's so different to every person, you know, it's like going to brush your teeth, it's a very personal experience, which is experienced differently. I'm guessing each and every one of you brushes his teeth or her teeth in a very singular, unique way. So you claim you have the qualia. I know I have the qualia, I know it, I'm having it right now, yeah? But I'm not really sure about you guys. Like, maybe you're just saying that. Maybe you're just philosophical zombies coming to these lectures and trying to convince me that you're real human beings, but you're not. Um, it's a hard question, right? But we won't solve it today. But you get the gist with the qualia thing? Qualia is the subjective experience of things in the world. It's something that each and every person has if they're not a philosophical zombie. So, what Thomas Nagel, in a very, very compelling article from 1974, says uh, that it's kind of impossible to explain what the subjective experience of a person is. And he gives the example of the bat. He says that um, a bat is a mammal, right? It's more similar to us than, I don't know, bugs. Or let's say, like you could say, you could talk about bugs, but then people would say, no, they're very different than human beings. But a bat is definitely a mammal. It's like in the family. And a bat has subjective experience, right? A bat lives in the world and experiences the world. Like my cat, for instance, which is completely insane, <laughs> experiencing the world from a very bad place. But uh, the bat experiences the world otherwise. Now, today we can explain how a bat works, how a bat functions. We know a lot about bat biology and the neurobiology of its brain. And we know how bat brains work. And we know what bats like to do and what they feel about specific foods, etc. Uh, bats have a unique quality, by the way, in the family of mammals. Anybody knows what it is? Sorry? Right, exactly, absolutely, 100 points, because you spoke. <laughs> guys, you get points, okay. Uh, absolutely, echolocation, sonar. They have this unique thing in their brain that enables them to sort of detect distances, detect textures, detect, I don't know, uh, consistencies of objects from afar by shooting these, you know, these sort of like I don't know, these waves, and they come back and they get this whole, the information about the in, their environment. Humans obviously don't have this. We don't have sonar, unfortunately. Uh, but we do know that bats do have sonars. There are some bats that are so blind that are completely reliant on sonar. And we know they have them, and we can explain it also. We can explain how sonar works, and there's books, you can go to the library and sort of read how sonar works, what does it do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Nagel really agrees with that, and he says, yeah, science is really great, because we now can explain all these things. But Nagel says there's one thing we cannot really explain, and that is how it is like to be a bat. This is the name of the article, what it is like to be a bat. So we can explain how the bat works, how his brain works, but we cannot explain what is the qualia of a bat. How does the bat see the world through sonar? Because we have no capacity to fathom that. We have no capacity to understand that, how the bat sees the world through sonar, right? So what Nagel actually says is that 
this thing called qualia is unexplainable. Uh, we cannot really give an answer to what it is because the only answer can come from the subjective experience itself. And the bats sort of prove this point, right? We cannot talk about the bats. And Nagel gives some examples about Martians, which I really like. I really like when people bring sci-fi into their academic articles. And he says, uh, yeah, maybe there would be Martians and they would uh, meet us and they could understand us completely because they're really smart and they have a great Martian science, but they'll never be able to explain what it is like to be human. I'll go even further, I can't even explain what it is like to be you, right? It's like, we, we can take it even that way, like bat is very far, but I'm pretty convinced that your world is really crazy. Uh, <laughs> working in, with psychoanalysis for a long time, you learn that really quickly, right? Uh, people are insane and they see the world very differently and they experience it very differently and the qualia is something that is very elusive, even completely, according to Nagel. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or qualia, right. So you're saying it's sort of something that evolved. Yeah, a lot of people agree with that. And I think it's very relevant for this because we might, we might disagree that fish have consciousness, maybe. Um, I don't know how vegetarian you are. It depends. Uh, but we sure, surely agree that mammals have consciousness. They just walk in the world. They sort of... Like, it's, it's harder to argue about that. So that's why we're talking about consciousness in mammals, and yeah, it might be something that sort of evolved. We'll, we'll try and explain it in a bit. We'll, we'll have a model trying to explain consciousness in animals. Okay, we'll try and see that. Um, and by the way, not vegetarian, but we'll try and see if it's, it's a good idea to be a vegetarian, right? Um, okay, so that's Thomas Nagel and the what it is likeness argument. He says, like, this thing, this is what it is like, it's impossible to explain. So we cannot explain it and therefore we should just leave it, you know? We just say that's what it is and we're not going to explain it. Uh, another interesting argument can be found in an article by uh, Jackson. It's called uh, What Mary Didn't Know. It's a, it's a really interesting thought experiment, so let's do it uh, together. Uh, what Jackson says is, um, Mary is this girl, she was born one day, and when she was born, uh, I don't know who, somebody put her in a room, which only has black and white colors, like monochromatic, there, there are no colors in the room, there are only black and white, she, and from the first moment that she was born, she has only seen black and white colors, she has never seen color. But Mary has this uh, TV or this endless library or this, I don't know, uh, smartphone and she can go online or whatever she wants. Let's say she has infinite capacity to learn anything she wants. And she can learn anything about colors, about the experience of seeing colors. And actually Mary is a really smart girl and she really is interested in the psychology of people, of humans, and she's interested in what do we see? How do we see things? And she can explain everything. Let's say Mary is really, really smart. And she's studied it for many years. And at this point, she has all the knowledge there is that can be written down, that can be explained or shown uh, in black and white about what it is like to see a red tomato. Right? She knows everything about it. She can explain exactly which neurons in the brain fire. She knows exactly what the person feels. Like she can describe it. Uh, she, she knows everything to know about it. That's why this is called also the knowledge argument. Because at this point, if we are physicalists, if we believe that physical explanations can explain what qualia is, what consciousness is, 
we believe that Mary knows everything there is to know about what it is like to see a red tomato. She's read everything about it. She knows everything in the world to know about it. But obviously, you know, we won't keep Mary in the room so long. One day she escapes, somehow. Uh, she goes outside and she sees a red tomato. And at that moment, she sort of like, huh, she sort of like learns something new. She learns what it is like to see a red tomato. She experiences the qualia, the experience of red tomato-ness. Now, if we assume just a moment ago that Mary knows everything there is to know about what it is like to see a red tomato, and at this moment she escaped and she obviously learned something new, we're obviously mistaken by this assumption. We're mistaken to think that Mary knew everything there is to know. And from this, Jackson sort of implies that science, physics, cannot really explain everything. There is something which is unexplainable, and the only way to know something about it is to actually experience it, right? So the mystery of consciousness is unexplainable. This is, it's, a good, it's a good example. Let's, let's just play with it a bit. Think about a person born deaf, never heard anything. How can you explain to a deaf person how does a trumpet sound? Maybe you can say it's a very velvety color. I don't know. Uh, you say Miles Davis makes you cry. Okay, great. You can teach that person a whole lot about what a trumpet sounds like, but the qualia, that is something we will never be able to teach a deaf person. So there's something that if you do not personally, subjectively, consciously experience, this thing cannot be explained. So this is these, these guys saying, no way, there's something that cannot be explained. Okay, any questions about, uh, about Nagel or Jackson? Okay. Because conscious experience cannot be explained uh, through knowledge through knowledge as we know it, you know, no, through knowledge which is not conscious knowledge. But since we experience it, can't we explain it? So, wh when you experience something, you sort of learn something new. Okay. Then you can try and tell me how it was, right? You can tell me it was great, but, you know, you can go and hear a trumpet and experience it and have this qualia, but then you have to tell me how it is. <coughs> but to me, you'll never be able to tell what it is, right? You, you, you cannot explain it. You will never be able to explain it. Have you seen The Matrix? Uh, again, I'm saying only watch the first one. The, the other ones are horrific. Um, but in The Matrix, there's a cool part which I really like. Uh, this um, one of the main uh, characters, um, Trinity is her name, sort of they need to fly a helicopter. And she doesn't know how to fly in a helicopter, so she goes to this computer and she says, okay, helicopter, enter. And it's like, like downloads it to her brain. So that's great. And theoretically, okay, maybe the computer sort of downloaded the qualia of learning to fly a helicopter. I don't know how many of you ride a bicycle, probably all of you, but if you do not try it, you can read all you want. You can read many, many, many books. But if you don't try it, you will never know how to ride a bicycle. So there's sort of like this thing about subjective experience that is untransmittable. It stays with you, right? And that's why I don't know that you're actually not philosophical zombies. Okay, so we'll continue in this, on this paranoid note um, to some other guys uh, that they say, yeah, definitely we can explain what consciousness is. So we're a bit more optimistic. Tell you the truth, we're gonna stay on this side today. All right. um, couple of approaches, uh, philosophical approach. Uh, we're gonna be investigating this approach. Uh, these are like um, sort of modern theories. Uh, 1984 is quite contemporary in philosophy. So um, these are modern theories that try to explain what is consciousness. We're gonna study the hope theory that's higher order perception theory of consciousness, and it's based on this guy called Armstrong. We're gonna meet this guy in a second. Uh, so these guys try to explain it in philosophical means, and we have also 
doctors and psychologists that explain what consciousness is. They can really tell us, like, on a checklist, what does it mean to be conscious? You know, people, sometimes people say, like, a person has, you know, the, the brain has stopped functioning. You know, you can, you can check that. So if that happens, the doctor says, the person is not conscious, will never be conscious, and that's a medical fact. So these guys say they know what consciousness is and have some approaches to demonstrate it. Uh, psychologists, uh, for instance, use fMRI to show where in the brain consciousness is, and then they can say, okay, now the person is conscious and now the person is not conscious. They can uh, try to do that today, but we're gonna concentrate on the philosophy of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. So we're gonna try and give an answer to the hard problem of consciousness in analytical philosophy, that part of philosophy for uh, philosophers with great haircuts. Um, the hop theory. This is sort of how the lecture is gonna look like uh, from now on until uh, the end of the lecture. Uh, this is David Armstrong, and we're gonna base ourselves quite directly on his article called What is Consciousness? If you're interested in what we're talking on about today, definitely go to Google Scholar. This thing is, I think it's open uh, for people to read. Uh, it's a very easy article. It's really nice to read. Like Armstrong writes very well. Uh, we're gonna talk about the unconscious a bit. We're gonna talk more about that next week. Uh, we're gonna talk about something that's called causal properties. It's sort of like a thing causes a thing causes a thing. This is how Armstrong describe consciousness. And we're gonna talk about relations between levels of consciousness. So for Armstrong, there's not only one consciousness, there are levels of consciousness, and their causal interaction is what actually describes consciousness, consciousness gives us an answer to what is consciousness. <coughs> so we're gonna do this lecture starting from the minimal level, going to the level of perception, and eventually getting to the level of introspective consciousness. Ready? Good, okay. So, minimal consciousness. We're gonna do them one by one. Um, okay, in order to understand what minimal consciousness is, uh, let's try and understand what an unconscious person is. So, we're gonna sort of hypothesize this unconscious state uh, because, you know, when somebody is unconscious, uh, let's say maybe sleeping or maybe under anesthesia, he's not really completely unconscious. Uh, some things still go on in the brain, right? Until we're dead, then everything stops. So this is sort of a hypothetical situation we're gonna, we're gonna think about. So let's think about this guy and let's say he's unconscious. So a person that is unconscious, completely unconscious, uh, we would still say that this person has mental states. Okay, what is a mental state? It's sort of like a, a knowledge that he has, or memories, or the beliefs that he has about the world. So even an unconscious person has mental states. Okay, um, let's try and think about an intuitive example. We'll take two people. Okay, let's say both of them are unconscious, or under deep, deep anesthesia. Okay? And one of them is a history teacher from a school, and another one is sells, I don't know, sells bicycles. Um, the history teacher obviously knows a lot about uh, the history of, of, I don't know, ancient Greece, because she's an expert on that, and she has uh, um, one child, and this week she was really depressed. She really didn't like the fact that it's raining so much in Berlin. And the other person, the bike person, he is just a... Um, you know, free-spirited Australian uh, decided to open a bike shop in Berlin and he doesn't care about history at all and he's actually really happy this week. So both of these people are unconscious right now, but we have to agree there's a difference between them. They're not the same. Their mental states are different. One has memories about history, the other has memories about bicycles, the other has beliefs about reality which makes him happy and the other one feels sad. So there is a difference in their mental states. What is the same about these two guys is the fact that there is no mental activity in their mind. So they have mental states, but they are quiet. 
they don't work, they don't function, they don't cause anything to actually happen. Now, when we talk about mental activities, we're talking about perceptions like viewing, seeing the world, we're talking about thinking thoughts, we're talking about sensations, what I feel. So these two guys that are unconscious have mental states, which differentiate them, but they are the same because they have no mental activity. Now, I always give this example because I'm very nostalgic about computers. I don't know if you ever used um, MS-DOS. Have you used that in the past? Good guys, very good. So, solidarity. Um, <laughs> a long time ago, for the younger people, right? a, a long time ago, when um, we still had that thing called a diskette, you know, it was a very cute thing, uh, completely useless today. Uh, we had this thing, it looks like this. If you had a PC, uh, it was only this. This is already in Windows, but this is, you had this black screen, and you'd open the computer, and then you'd see this like command line, and you'd, you'd have to write to the computer what you want them to do. So you're like, CD space games, enter, and then it opens the, the game directly. It was very excruciating. <laughs> but one thing that was always nice, I don't know if you did that, uh, when the computer does not do anything, it, it has this line here, and it sort of blinks. You know, it sort of shows you, I'm still alive, don't worry. You can tell me what to do, right? But in this moment where the computer is sort of blinking this line, waiting for your command, we can theoretically say that the computer has mental states. It has its memory, it has all these games that I downloaded to it from all these diskettes. It has uh, the, this document I wrote last week. It has capacities also. It has the capacity to write, it has the capacity to format the hard drive. So all of these are sort of capacities that are stored in the computer itself. But at this moment, they are completely inactive. No operation is active. The computer is waiting for activity. When I press, I don't know, play, uh, Monkey Island, I don't know, enter, then the, then the mental states start to be active and the computer starts to run these programs, these algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, and we have what we can call mental activity, okay? Now, minimal consciousness is that exact moment when there is the minimal amount of mental activity. So if we have an unconscious person, is a person that only has mental states and all of them are inactive, and minimal consciousness is the point in which at least one mental state is activated. When we have one mental state at least activated, we know we have minimal consciousness. So the unconscious Sorry? The unconscious mind is always in there. So, b believe me, I'm a Freudian, right? Okay, we don't need to, to do that. Right, I agree, we'll talk about this next week. But today we have like a um, different conception of unconsciousness. Unconsciousness would be no consciousness meaning no mental activities. That's our definition today. That is how Armstrong defines the unconscious. Meaning control, like we have a control experience. Let's say minimal consciousness is the first moment where what we can call control shows its face. Before minimal consciousness, there is only a computer blinking, not doing anything, just waiting for a command. There are only mental states and there is no mental activity. When we have mental activity, we have minimal consciousness, okay? So let's summarize this, and then I want to see if you have questions or something like that, so prepare for that. Um, an unconscious man has mental states, okay? That's something we need to agree upon. If a man is unconscious, these mental states are necessarily what Armstrong calls a causally quiescent. Uh, this means that they're causally inactive, they don't work. Uh, minimal activation of a mental state entails minimal consciousness. Okay, this is exactly what we said, and this is the lowest level of consciousness. Minimal consciousness, some activity, not only states, but also activity. Are you with me? Good, any questions about minimal consciousness? You'll need to understand this in order to get the rest of the things. So if there are some questions, please indulge me. But maybe I'm so clear, so let's continue. Good. Yeah. 
So um, let's say that a person in a coma, which if we look at an fMRI, let's say, and we see mental activity, will say he has minimal consciousness, right? We're talking about an unconscious person only hypothetically, because we don't really see people which have no mental activity. But hypothetically, there is a point where you have mo no mental activity. One day you will have no mental activity, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and that means that you will have no consciousness. But when you have minimum of mental activity, that means minimal consciousness. Doesn't mean you're conscious, right? Doesn't mean that you're conscious like we will see in a second. It means you have minimal consciousness, okay? Not still full-blown consciousness. Good, great question. Okay, thanks. Question? Continue, okay. Next level of consciousness, perceptual consciousness. That's an easy one. Um, that's just your senses, your perception working. We have senses which give us, give us information about the environment, about the world. I look around, I see what's going on, and I can also learn about my body. This is something that's going inside my body and you uh, don't really know, like that horrible taco, taco I ate yesterday. So I have these senses that tell me about the world and about my body. And perceptual consciousness is just the ability to sense the world and the body, right? So let's say just the general ability to sense what's going on. Now, I'm giving here the, the example of the dream because we can say hypothetically that in the dream we do not sense the world and our body. Right? Sort of it's a different place. It's not the environment and it's not the interior of our body. But there's always this example, I don't know if you have this, I always have this because I have um, <laughs> uh, young neighbors upstairs and they sort of like function as my obnoxious alarm clock every morning. And you know, you, you sometimes have the alarm and it works and it sort of buzzes uh, and you don't wake up. Um, when I uh, used to live in, in Tel Aviv, I um, had the, the, the garbage trucks, they would always come at around like five in the morning, something like that, and they do a lot of noise. It really seems like these people are sort of like dancing and banging on the garbage cans, like sort of doing a song, I don't know. But it used to wake me up, but then after some time, it just sort of incorporated in my dream. You know, you have that, the, the, the alarm rings, but then in your dream, you, you have a school alarm or something like that. So it's, it gets inside your dream. So if this happens, we have to say that there is perceptual consciousness because you perceive something from the outside world. So even when we dream, we do have perceptual consciousness. Okay, but dream, like dreaming sort of wants to keep us sleep, asleep. So sometimes it sort of incorporates itself into the dream. But perceptual consciousness at its base is just the ability to perceive. Okay, that's an easy one, right? So, um, we said perceptual consciousness is the ability to perceive our body and our environment. Okay. Perceptual consciousness necessitates a level of minimal consciousness. Why? Why do you think? Why would perceptual consciousness necessitate, why would it be necessary to have mental states in order to have perceptual consciousness? Any ideas? Yes? Right. Absolutely, right, this is very accurate. Yeah, like when we see things, we, you know, we see objects, we, I see a chair, I don't see futons, right? In order to see a chair and when I walk not to hit that chair, I need to know what a chair is, I need to know what space is, I need to know what walking is, I need to know how to walk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I need all these states already hardwired in my brain in order to perceive the world. It's not enough just to have a retina. We also need mental states. So let's say this camera right here, maybe, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have perceptual uh, consciousness, okay? So we have perceptual consciousness necessitating a level of minimal consciousness, but it doesn't work the other way around. Minimal consciousness does not necessitate perceptual consciousness. For instance, in what example? Example of the unconscious guy, right? Unconscious guy, 
maybe we, he has some mental activity, right? The guy in the coma, right? But he definitely doesn't have perceptual consciousness. So now we can differentiate, right? We can differentiate a, a person in a coma which has minimal consciousness, has mental activity, but he does not have full-blown consciousness because he's lacking this level of consciousness. He doesn't have perceptual consciousness, okay? So we see it works like from this way up, but doesn't work the other way around. This is not a everything. There's, a, there's another part to consciousness, which is really important, uh, which sort of like closes the whole deal and, and gives us a picture of what, what's going on. Uh, before we continue, any question on perceptual consciousness? I'm sort of annoying you with, with this. Uh, do you, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Great question. Like, yeah, absolutely. First of all, the, like I just have to say, guys, it's not that I believe. I'm just presenting a perspective. So it's not definitely my personal perspective. But I just enjoy presenting this perspective, as you can see. So it might seem that it's my perspective, but it's not really. But let's say this unconscious person. Hypothetically, we can have an unconscious person with perceptual consciousness. You know, we have these stories of these people saying, I was in a coma, but I heard my mother, and I talked to her, I, I heard her, I saw her in my dreams. So we'd say, this situation, the person has minimal consciousness and perceptual consciousness. But then we have some other situations where people are in a coma, and they do not perceive the environment or their body. They, know, they don't perceive any of that, and then we'll say they have minimal consciousness, but not perceptual consciousness. Okay, so the idea is not to say that all, un all people in coma have or don't have, great question though, but we are now better, we have better tools to differentiate between different levels of coma, right? So it's basic tools. <coughs> So that's impossible. Why? why? Why is that impossible even for my crazy cat? Which obviously has perceptual consciousness because she doesn't hit walls. You know, she, she walks around the house and she doesn't hit the walls. But why does she have to have minimal consciousness? Yeah, because of memory. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have to have minimal consciousness in order to have perceptual consciousness. Right? Because only perceiving is not enough. We need to have some knowledge. And we need to have the mind being active about this knowledge and being active in perception. Okay? Great. Thank you. 50 points. You too. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next level. This is called the introspective level of consciousness. And uh, in the article, um, Armstrong gives a beautiful example of a truck driver, which also is very gender sensitive and it's a female truck driver. Uh, but I'll give you a personal example from my life. Mm. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I grew up in a very um, secluded place in Israel, in the <coughs> desert. It's very boring, there's nothing to do, I swear. And at some point uh, in Israel, it's the age of 16 and a half, I don't know what it is right now, you get your license and there's sort of freedom, uh, in the desert at least, because um, cities are very far and there's nothing to see in the middle except for nylon bags. That, that, that's my memory of desert nylon bags. But anyways, I got my license and I started uh, using the car and driving and because I, I lived next to a very, very silly and boring city, there weren't a lot of places to go. There was one place we could go as a gang, as a group, you know, as a group of friends. We'd constantly go to this place. They would sell this specific food. It's called sambusak. It's like sort of like a pastry filled with something. But we would constantly go, the place was called the, the uh, warm, warm corner of the heart, you can call it. That's the, tra the exact translation. And we would go there almost every day. Um, we didn't have a lot to do. So I used to take the car and take the same route again and again and again and again for more than a year, more than even a year and a half until I sort of moved out and continued with my life next to the beach which is much nicer. Uh, but I sort of like learned that, that course and, and did it a lot, a lot, a lot of times. And in the future, like about five years later, I just came back to visit my parents and I took, um, I wanted to use my mother's car. I don't know why, but I wanted to use her car. So I said, I'll 
drive her to her work. I'll take you to her workplace and then I can take the car and do uh, whatever I like. And she said, okay, and we were driving the car and I was driving the car and we were talking about stuff. I was talking about school and stuff like that. And all of a sudden she tells me, hey, um, where are you going? Like, this is not the direction to my workplace. And then I noticed, yeah, I'm going to that same place with the sambusak. I'm just automatically going there. Uh, that's the other side of town, right? And then I sort of like, oh, what am I doing? And I took the road to the university. That's where she works. And the thing is, the thing Ar Armstrong says that in this moment, we're sort of like realized, oh, what am I doing for all this time? At this moment, a certain level of consciousness was regained. Because when I was driving, I was doing it sort of automatically. You know, I wasn't really paying attention. I, I didn't really know where I'm going. And then all of a sudden, I was aware. I was conscious of the fact that I am driving to that restaurant instead to, of to my mother's workplace. Now, Armstrong says that this is introspective consciousness. Okay. Introspective consciousness would be consciousness of the perceptions and mental states that we have in the mind. So this is a third level of consciousness that is not conscious, let's say, because there's mental activity or is not conscious because I perceive something. It is conscious of these two levels, okay? Now, we need to sort of like delve into this and sort of try and understand this a bit, a, a bit better. Um, We'll, we'll talk about a truck driver just for the sake of the argument. So the truck driver or me, when I was driving the car, I had minimal consciousness. My mind was working. There was mental activity, obviously. Uh, obviously, I also had perceptive consciousness, right? I had to see the road, I had to feel the wheel, had to think about how much pressure I'm, in, I'm like investing in the wheel and turning it. And you know, also with the leg, I have to press the gas and look around and maybe listen to people that honk, etc. Et so a lot of perception was going on, a lot of mental activity. And we've already said that perceptive consciousness is independent on the minimal consciousness, like how to operate the body, to recognize signs to know that a green light means go and a red light means stop. So all of these are mental states that have to be hardwired in order for me to do this driving, to do this thing. Now we also see that combining perceptive consciousness and minimal consciousness enables us to do very skillful, purposeful activities, like driving a car. That's kind of complicated. <coughs> Let a kid drive a car, it's very complicated. Let a robot drive a car, that's very complicated. I have a good friend that works in a company that tries to create cars that drive themselves. It's very, very complicated. You need to take so many variables into consideration. You need to see everything, to feel everything, and you need to be very conscious, very perceptively conscious to all these things. So the combination of these two enables driving. But the combination of these two doesn't necessarily include introspective consciousness. And you know, you drove a car, I'm guessing, and usually, like a lot of times when you drive a car at night, you listen to the radio, you don't really notice where you're going. And then an hour and a half later, oh yeah, I need to take a left turn, okay? You sort of regain your introspective consciousness. You sort of say, oh, right, I'm driving, right. So, the combination of these two doesn't necessarily include it, but when we are conscious of the perceptive and minimal levels of consciousness, we have introspective consciousness. Okay? So we have three levels here, working and interacting. And sort of Armstrong is trying to say that consciousness is not each one of them alone, but the specific interaction that the three of them enable. Now let's see the whole model in, in this drawing right here. What Armstrong says is we first have the minimal level of consciousness. This is any mental activity which is, enables knowledge or memory. This is the knowledge or memory of driving being activated. Right? This is something that we have to have in order to drive a car. The second level is the perceptive level. 
The perceptive level is sort of the perception of the environment and the body. But not only that, the perceptive level has to be conscious of the minimal level. It has to have access to the minimal level and work with that access in order to make perception mean something. Then we have the introspective level, which is when I'm sort of saying, hey, I'm driving, right? The introspective level has to be conscious of the perspective, uh, perceptive level and the minimal level together. What Armstrong says, basically, is when you have a creature, a computer, a person, which has three levels of consciousness, which have this axis and function through these relations, you have consciousness. So this little square here is consciousness. This is Armstrong's explanation of consciousness. Okay, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. W what do you think? Like, how does it sound? So, yeah. Right, so let's think about that. That's a great question. Okay, do autonomous cars have minimal consciousness? We would say yes, theoretically yes, because they have in them hardwired information and knowledge about driving. Do they have perceptive consciousness? Yeah, why? Sensors. sensors. They have to sense the environment. If I send a, a intelligent car without sensors, it's going to hit the wall, right? So it has to be perceptively conscious to the environment. Does it have introspective level? No. That's a good question. Maybe. Maybe. Right. So, this automatic car wouldn't know that it's an automatic car. So, the wrong perspective. No, you don't know if you have perspective level. If you're given the knowledge, you are autonomous. But you will never have a subjective experience of being the car. Well, that's a good question. So don't be racist toward cars. Okay. okay. <laughs> you know, maybe one day. Like, what we can definitely say is that without an introspective level, the car would not have this consciousness of self, right? But theoretically, if we can sort of hardwire that into the car, it will have a conception of self. That would be pretty cool. Like the Knight Rider, right? It has this car, which obviously has introspective capacities, okay? Uh, it's a good question. It's like a sci-fi question, right? Okay, so that's, so intelligent car today has two levels, but not the third one. So we, phew, okay, not yet. Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, not yet, not yet. Okay, any more ideas? Yes. Right, another excellent question. Where do we see qualia in this, in this diagram? Where, where does qualia appear? Sorry? So yes, it follows, it follows the introspective level of consciousness, but it necessitates the three levels. Okay, so you can't have a, a, a qualia only having introspective consciousness, right? Introspective consciousness means nothing without a minimal and a perceptive level of consciousness, right? So qualia would be this, you know, this structure, this like three level structure in here, right here, this is the manifestation of qualia. This is how we explain qualia through this. Right? This is theoretically a way to teach uh, you to drive, to um, fly a helicopter, right? So that if we sort of wrap our mind around it and have technology which is developed enough, right? So that's a great question. So qualia is sort of manifest through the interactions from this level. What do you think about animals? Animals. Yeah? Animals have three. Right. Minimal level, obviously. Perceptive level, yeah. Introspective. Yeah. Like, do you care, care to give an example? Uh, no, you don't care. <laughs> okay, so. Right, okay, that's, that's a nice valid point. Animals have symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so may, maybe we can say that. I can definitely account for my animals, which have symptoms. You, you wanted to say something? Um, yeah. Um, no, but it's, uh, there is like the different levels of, well, I'm not talking about the dead, like you can have an introspective consciousness of um, 
Ja. Absolut. That is that's absolutely my next point. That's absolutely valid. No, that's absolutely the idea. You know, when I was driving the car, I was not introspectively conscious to the perception of the road and the mental activity that enabled me to control the car, but I was definitely introspectively perceptive or introspectively conscious to my discussion with my mother. So introspective consciousness is not something which is all-encompassing. Like we are not conscious to everything all the time. It is selective. You know? it's the, we select the resources, we invest introspective consciousness, right? So when driving the car, I sort of chose to be introspective to my mother, which is very polite because I'm a good son, you know? And, but eventually I also drove her to a job, which is also important, and yeah. When you turn down the music to concentrate well in a story, mm -hmm. and I don't do it as you do, so you, you go into this big crescendo story, and when you're watching a movie and it's not so loud, turn down the light, <coughs> loud light in the when you want to experience Right. So you do that to get a, a good sense of connection. Absolutely. This, this is going definitely to the field of psychology and what we call um, attention span. Mm. You know, um, why are we feeding uh, children with these drugs today? You know, yeah, you have this thing that's called attention span, like the, the ability to sort of define the margins of your introspective consciousness. Okay? And you see why this, this theory is valid in these domains as well. It's, it's very important to describe these phenomena as well, sort of give us better tools to deal with that. Right? Um, so yes, like introspective is not only selective, it's also varying in size, right? Sometimes I'm really concentrated on something. I can really absorb a lot. Sometimes I can't, no. Right, good, yes. Is this higher? Sorry? Is higher level than right, so on this theory, we're sort of on the highest level, okay? We have, uh, we have some more stuff, some more surprises, don't worry. But uh, this is the third and final level of, of the model that Armstrong suggests. Yes? Uh, it still seems to me like I don't understand something. Like, it seems to me to see how this connects with Wiley. Okay. I'll, I'll explain. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me like this is an explanation of what you defined in the beginning as the key tone of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Your assumption is first to describe how the <coughs> system works. Mm -hmm. And then it says, okay, if you can explain functionally how the system works using these three levels or what, whatever you want, if you can explain functionally the system, then you don't really need to explain the right. hard point of consciousness because it just can be reduced somehow, but I don't see this as that. Great, I was, really, I was really waiting for someone to say that, right. So Armstrong is sort of saying I'm explaining qualia here because he's giving us a functional model of how qualia functions, you know? And it's sort of, this is like a, a um, meta model. It's not, it's not saying the brain works like that, you know, there's a part of the brain which does like that, da, 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 da. It gives like a functional model. It's sort of like an algorithm. And he says with this, you can create qualia. With this, you can create a being which has qualia. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, Chalmers will definitely say, say that. This is not the answer. You're still not explaining, you're still not conveying through knowledge what is the experience of redness. Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. These guys are still stuck on that question. This fight between the Chalmers guys and these guys, we have Daniel Dennett we talked about, it's still going on. They're still writing articles about each other. And still, and Daniel Dennett in a just recent lecture said, we still don't have a final answer. We still don't know, right? I have to give you the limit of what is experience of consciousness is, because for example, I'm mm -hmm. describing what is the yeah. Or what it is to be sit down in a chair. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I could start from describing the chair till how I'm sitting in the chair, mm -hmm. and then I could continue with the room. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of unlimited. Yeah. So maybe the concept of consciousness will be all what it is, will always be open. So we never know what would be the limit of the experience of consciousness. Right. It's 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 exactly a valid point. And you know, like I said, you know, guys, I'm really appreciate these theories, but then like, you know, 
personally, there, there are a lot of other theories that, that talk exactly about that, about subjectivity being this thing that is, we cannot say anything about it. You know, it's, um, uh, there's a lot of concepts like that. So, uh, a what conscious level? <laughs> that's a great, that's a great question. So we say ignorance is bliss, right? So I'd say like maybe complete ignorance is having these two levels, right? But then we're not conscious. You know, they say if you're completely ignorant, you're not human. You're not. You don't have consciousness. Or some people criticize the Buddha, for instance. You know, when they say Nirvana, the point where the ego is erased. Let's say the point where introspective level is is gone, right? Uh, you're not really human. You're not really a person anymore. So what are you, right? It's sort of like death, right? So yeah, again, there's a lot, a lot to say about that, but, sorry? Okay. Right. Yeah, right. Well, we have many answers and Maybe none of them is good enough, right? But that's just the, your mental structure speaking. For me, nothing is good enough, right? That's how I see things. Uh, also this, but you know, even if it doesn't, even you, and your point was completely valid, even if it doesn't give us that answer, this model is still interesting, it's still valuable uh, to explain what it is, what qualia is, okay? And maybe not to convey qualia, but to explain the structure or functionality of a creature that is able to have qualia. And with this model, I can actually maybe one day look into your brain and know if you're philosophical zombies or not. Right? Because I'll see if you have this model in your brain and then I'll be happy. So zombie doesn't have any Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So we go back to the zombie. So the zombie example. Zombie would have perceptive and minimal level. He will walk the world, perceive everything, act because he has the knowledge. He knows how to act but he will never have the introspective level of actually saying, I am driving. He will always be on autopilot. Okay, always drive uh, to that restaurant, right? Good. Types of reflexive consciousness. Um, guys, are you with me? We have a bit more. Uh, types of reflexive consciousness. Armstrong gives us two types, uh, which are valuably, like they, they have different values. Uh, there's the reflex introspective awareness or reflex introspective consciousness. This is something that Armstrong says is always present when we're awake. It's, it's always there. Uh, perception is never completely without consciousness. It's something that we, it's always there when we observe the world and our thoughts. But there's the other level which Armstrong calls introspection proper which is the explicit and, you know, the, the self-conscious scrutiny of your perceptions or your ideas. It's when you think about your ideas, or I'm looking at this plan, I'm saying it's really big. You know, it's sort of like, I'm sort of introspectively thinking about my perceptions. This is introspection proper. So we have two levels. Interesting thing. And this is developed uh, by Rosenthal, and, uh, which is sort of like collaborating with Armstrong and developing these, these uh, systems. Uh, we can have introspective level of consciousness, which is introspective to introspective level of consciousness. Okay, so let's, let's see how it works. So we have the perceptive level. I don't know how, much of you, how many of you play, I don't know, soccer or something like that. I really enjoy playing soccer when, when you take it not very seriously. I like, I like playing soccer when you're not serious about it. But sometimes when you play soccer, you get hurt and you don't really notice. You don't even feel the pain. You're not aware of the pain. And then only after half an hour where you play, you see you're bleeding and then, oh shit, I'm bleeding. And then you start feeling the pain. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah, it's something that happens to us, right? So we can say that when I was wounded, right? I had this information, this perception of pain, but that was on the perceptive level, right? That was the awareness of painness. There was pain. Yeah, if you measure the, the body's reaction, you'll see pain. But then I wasn't having introspective level of consciousness about that pain. Only half an hour later, when I looked at my wound and sort of touched it, I was saying, oh, I have pain. Here is, I have a headache. 
Like, so I can have a headache for half an hour, not notice it, not be aware of it, but still I will perceive it as a bodily phenomenon on the perspective level and only then gain introspective awareness to that level and say, oh, I have a headache. So this is basic introspective consciousness. But then I can have another introspective level about that introspective level. So I would say I am aware to my awareness of the headache. So that's a very Woody Allen thing to do, being very neurotic. You know, this is, this is an explanation of obsessive thinking. It's an introspection of the introspecting level. So Woody Allen would say, I'm thinking too much about the fact that I have headaches, right? So we have the perceptive level of the awareness of pain, the awareness, the introspective awareness of this pain, I have a headache, and the awareness of this awareness, I'm thinking too much about these headaches that I have. Can we have another introspective level? Yes, theoretically. Where does it go? Where does it end? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Sorry? More and more dramatic, right? You become more and more dramatic. Although all the characters in Woody Allen movies, it doesn't matter how neurotic they are, they always, they always know exactly uh, what love is. I think it's a very hard question, but they sort of seem to know it, maybe unconsciously, right? Okay, so that's the hot theory. Uh, just to wrap things up, um, we talked about the self. And the self also has to do with the introspective level, according to Armstrong. Uh, Armstrong says what the introspective level does is sort of like he does three things which sort of creates the thing that is called self. It's very interesting because it's, it's a little bit, it's even a little Freudian to say that the self is a construction, right? It's not, there's a very big field in psychoanalysis, ego psychology would say the self is the, the major entity in, the, in the, let's say, the core of the human, but maybe you can read Freud and see that ego is actually a construction. So Armstrong says something similar. He says the self integrates these series of progressive perceptions, you know, like I'm perceiving you right now, and these are like a progression of pictures, a progression of sounds, right? But they are, they don't really have a unifying relation. They're just like one point in time, another point in time. And what Armstrong says is that the introspective level sort of integrates all these separate moments into one unity. So it gives us this unity of self. It creates the one thing which experiences reality. Another aspect of introspective uh, consciousness is uh, Armstrong describe it, describes it like a, a computer administrating a lot of computers. So let's say we have like a million computers and all of the computers do different tasks by themselves. When we get a, a big computer in the middle, it can sort of tell the other computers what to do. So instead of being dispersed and work by themselves, this uh, administrator computer will tell them, okay, now you invest your working capacity on this. And now you invest your working capacity on that. And that enables us to do more intricate things in the world. You know, if we're completely dispersed and just do whatever, maybe we won't be as sophisticated as we are today. And what Armstrong says is the introspective level of consciousness sort of like you said, it came into being in a certain level of evolution in order to administrate the mental capacities that we have. And that way we become smarter and we can have more attention span and we can do more complicated things in the world. Finally, what Armstrong says is that introspective consciousness is actually completely in charge of memory. And that is an interesting fact, because when you think about uh, the truck driver driving the truck or me driving the car, the point where memory actually starts writing itself is that point where I wake up from that, you know, that autopilot. I don't remember how the road looked like, you know? When I woke up and said, oh, I'm not driving there. I don't remember which red lights or which green lights I saw, yeah? The, capacity to create memories, according to Armstrong, necessitates the introspective consciousness of events. So what Armstrong actually says that introspective consciousness enables us to write our own life story. So it's not only making us into this one unity of 
uni united entity. It not only controls our resources and enables us to do complicated things, it also enables us to store memory in relation to this unity. So introspective consciousness is sort of like the condition for our personality, for how we see the world, for the way we experience different things. So, final presentation of the model. Um, we have these three levels, and as you see, introspective level can be self-introspective, right? And the introspective level creates the self. When you look at this, this is the outcome of Armstrong's work. Do we have criticism? Of course, but it's a very interesting start, I think, especially for scientific work and also for some philosophical uh, ideas about what consciousness uh, is. Um, what do you think about this model now with the new addition? Any thoughts? So we can say that the constant self-introspection, the constant introspective level of the introspective level, might, we might have a different way now to diagnose obsessive compulsive behavior. You know, we might have a tool to sort of explain it and maybe even treat it, right? So that's a direction to work, yes? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, self is, it cannot exist without a relation to these two, right? In order, let's say, in order to, mm, let's say, have a unity of mental processes, we need minimal activity, right? In order to administrate processes, we also need minimal activity. Uh, in order to have memory, in order to experience the world, we have to have minimal and perceptive level, right? So it's interdependent. You cannot just say that introspective level equals self. The relation between introspective level and these two levels and the self relation, this is what enables the self. So you're absolutely right on that. It's a holistic model. No level can work by itself. The combination of the levels sort of creates the magic of consciousness. Okay? Good. So, was lovely. Hope you uh, enjoyed this, although it was sort of a philosophy that you don't do on wine and you don't drink wine as you do it. I want to invite you next week uh, to a lecture that I really like about the unconscious. We're gonna talk about Freud, we're gonna talk about Lacan, and we're gonna have a lot of examples. And I want you guys, if you come, to be ready to give me a lot of symptoms. I would like to hear a lot of your craziness, okay? Because only with that we can, we can continue, okay? So thank you very much. See you.